um, Jake for our next presentation, the last presentation in this room about public sector. Thank you very much. So my name is Jake Benelov. Uh, for the past year, I've been working as a consultant uh, for the British government on the GovUK project. Uh, so this is a large-scale agile project uh, that's been delivering uh, the, the new uh, publishing portal for the UK government. And it's been in production for a year now. Uh, so today, I want to talk about that and also talk about uh, actually feedback because I mean that's the really useful thing I think for you hopefully um, in order to achieve you know, to deliver the project on time and with quite a bit of success the team used uh, a large number of different ways of feedback uh, getting information to make better decisions and hopefully these are things that can be quite applicable to your work, even if you're not in public sector. Um, just to clarify, uh, I had to de-scope in true agile fashion, because uh, that's why uh, the title is seven, but actually I, I will talk about five different types of feedback. And uh, <laughs> So let's start. Um, so the story of GovUK starts in 2010, and uh, UK government publishing, central government publishing, is in a bad state. Uh, it's very, very fragmented. There's 750 top-level domains, so 750 websites publishing information and services. The, there are central portals for information. There's DirectGov, which uh, contains a lot of citizen information, and Business Link, which is information aimed at businesses. Uh, but at that point, they are six years old and starting to really show their age. So, I mean, this, this is what it, uh, direct gov looked like in 2010. I mean, the, world, the, the web design is, is really 2004. Um, and actually, it's hard to see on this slide, uh, but actually each one of these are links. So, you know, a user comes to this, maybe they're not super literate, uh, super IT literate, you know, presented with this. You know, this isn't a good user experience, and, and Business Link is not much better. Uh, so every, you know, ev every department at this point is publishing their own information. So you have different departments, they have their own portal, they have their own ways of presenting information, they all look very different. Uh, how you interact with the sites are all very different as well. So as a user, every time you come to a new department website, you have to learn it afresh. There's no common interaction model. There's, uh, you have to really understand it from scratch. And worse still, you have to understand how Govern works in order to actually find information and use services provided by the government. Because it's all so fragmented, you have to first understand which department within government actually does the thing that you want to do first. Which, even for, for me, someone who's been working within government for a year, is hard enough sometimes. Uh, th this is practically impossible for, you know, you, you're already alienating a large chunk of your user base simply because they can't find the information uh, that, that you know, you're presenting to them or the service, the online service. And so th th in 2010, th the, the current state is, is pretty woeful. There's big usability issues with the existing sites um, and there's a lot of duplication. People are just publishing lots of information. There's no single source of truth. A lot of things are duplicated across many different places. And it's incredibly hard to find, to find what you're looking for. So uh, an, an influential report was published which, made suggest, uh, which suggested four things, which were fix transactional services, and I'll talk a bit about transactions later, fix publishing, 
go wholesale, not just retail, which means provide platforms for government services, i.e. APIs, so build services that would allow an ecosystem to be built up, so allow small, medium businesses to use the government services and offer services to the end consumer, and have a team that will actually control both the user experience and, and, and the delivery of all of these things. So really make sure that transactional services work for users, make sure publishing works for users, build APIs and have one team within government that controls how this is done and that it is done. So that team is the government digital service, that's the team I've been working with. So it sits within the cabinet office which is a ministerial department within central government. And if I had to illustrate what GDS is, it's probably this photo. So it, it's a combination of what you think civil service sh should be and the, 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 the modern face, sort of your, your hipster, you know, with your Sennheiser headphones. Um, and and it's, 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 I guess it's, it's really probably the best way to describe it is it's a startup within government. It's, it's a really, you know, it's a lot closer to a startup than a government institution. And so the team has built GovUK. So this, this is the site, the, the central portal that's been running for a year now. So GovUK is, is the, the entry point. It's, it's designed to be the entry point to government services and the single point uh, for government information. So as a user, you shouldn't have to understand the structure of government anymore. You just come here, and then this should guide you to anything that you want to do. Also, more importantly, it's, it's, a, it's designed to be a single brand. So once you've learned how to interact with GovUK, you shouldn't have to relearn it whenever you have anything to do with government. So the, the brand aspect means that the team's coming up with patterns that will be, you know, patterns that work, so they make sure they design the patterns, make sure that they're working, and then try to somehow create standards that will mean that those patterns are branded across everything that government does. So if you're, um, you know, if you come to GovUK, any service on that domain might be run by different board bodies and agencies, but it should have the same way of interacting with it. Uh, the, the user shouldn't have to learn new every time that they, they, they come to a new government website. So in October of last year, GovUK replaced Direct Govern Business Link. Uh, so this was a pretty large project. Uh, I think I don't think we exceeded 100 people, but I think it was more than 50 people working on it at any one time. Um, so one of the first things that the team did was create a big list of user needs. They they went through all of the content on the existing site and tried to identify what need they were fulfilling. So they identified 1,800. This was whittled down to 700 plus, uh, completely redesigned, rewritten user needs. So in the first six months, 188 million unique visits. And I mean, so th th this, is, this is the current production site. This is the new face of, of GovUK. Um, since, uh, uh, up, um, since October, 24 ministerial departments were turned off. So I, I, sh I showed you the number 750. So that is trying, you know, we're trying to, con to condense that and bring everyone onto the same common platform to reduce all that uh, duplication and wasted effort. So the, the ministerial departments, they, so you know, I'm showing you the new websites for the sites that I showed you earlier. So now you can see there's a much more common look and feel. There's also, this permeates through down to the, the style of writing, how information is presented. 
you know, it, it's truly designed to be a brand. So how people communicate with the the citizen, the end user, is branded and should be much more uniform now. So one of the things that GovUK does differently to the previous platforms is uh, trying to adopt a wider range of formats. So for a given piece of information, there are several ways how it could be presented. It could be presented as flat text or as some sort of interactive tool or uh, any number of ways. So, so here's just a few. I mean, here's a, here's a very simple way, just a, a very quick answer where you come in and look at it and, and then leave. Um, this is what the start of a transaction looks like. So here you would fill in some details, click on the on the search button, and that would link you off to some other service run by probably another department. So here's uh, more complex use cases would probably be displayed in a guide. So you've got sections of the guide here, and then you've got more in-depth information presented in this way. And GovUK also has um, dynamic content. So for, for things where it's appropriate, like very complex logic, whereas this would have probably been presented as very complex if-else style flat text. Now there are actually calculators and interactive forms that allow you to kind of you know, just click through and get an answer at the end rather than just do all the mental calculations in your head. And actually there are even bespoke things for very specific use cases like uh, the, the bank holidays, the, the national holidays. There is an app that just does bank holidays and there's a template that just shows this information. So the teams, the, the teams are not afraid to put in the time to get the, this right because actually when, when it comes up to these holidays, these, this is one of the top 10 most visited pages on the site. So it's, it's clearly an important use case. So you, know, you want to get this right. And, and so the, the team sort of has custom formats as well. So it's been a year now. Has, has the project been a success? So we're, we're definitely seeing a lot more traffic. So the, these are the historical visits from, from the same time last year of, of the sites that were replaced. And you can see we're almost doubling the amount of traffic. And actually, this has gone up again in the last couple of weeks. Um, it's way cheaper. So we managed to save 42 million pounds just in the last year. So this went from about 50 million down to eight. Um, a, a many fold decrease. And actually, nicely enough, it's, it's award winning. So it's won uh, several design awards and some writing awards. So hope, you know, it's, it's, it's got industry recognition as well, uh, which, which is nice. Um, so, and that's that's sort of a very quick overview about publishing and how Gov GovUK came about. Does anybody have any questions before I move on? Okay, so um, so that that's the background. But actually, why I really wanted to talk to you today was to talk about feedback. So, the the hopefully I've shown that the product the GovUK website is it, quite a complex thing um, and I don't think we would have been able to build it and have you know have the success th that we've had without using a whole lot of feedback and 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 the team the the, the GDS team the GovUK team they're, they're the probably the most feedback obsessed people I've worked with and hopefully this is the bit that isn't just isn't just relevant in the public sector. I think it's applicable in many different contexts. So I, I could talk about iterative development and cross-functional teams, TDD, continuous integration, and all those nice things. But actually, I think a lot of that's pretty well covered with books and articles and conference talks. So I actually don't want to talk about that. Um, I want to talk about the, the more unusual 
Uh, I did not update. So there should be five. So I'll talk about only five today. Um, uh, types of feedback that um, I haven't seen before. Uh, hopefully this will be quite something useful to you. So releasing early is number one. So if you, let's say you, you've been given the task to rewrite a nation's website, you know, what would you do? What, what would most people do? Um, I guess I probably would disappear for several weeks and months and maybe even years and kind of really think about it and, and plan it and, and, and you know, make sure I got it right and then you know, start writing code. Um, so the Communique team didn't do this. They, they released a, an alpha, publicly released prototype within 12 weeks of starting the project. And 12 weeks, this wasn't from like having the dev team together and that's when the time starts actually they had the core team only this was with upscaling and ramping up the team and hiring from start to public release in the 12 weeks and only 261,000 for government that's that's not a lot um, and i think this was this was almost kind of unprecedented um, very, yeah, the, 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 there could have been very many things that could have gone wrong by releasing incomplete code. And I mean, within 12 weeks, you can't, you know, you, you won't have built something that fulfills a, a purpose, a, a functional purpose. But, but actually, the goal was for learning. This was a true MVP. The, the goal wasn't to replace an existing service, it was actually to build a minimal viable product, something that lets the team learn more. And, and that's exactly that's exactly what it helped the team to do. Um, I mean, so this was this is what the, the alpha looked like, which so you, you can see it's actually quite a bit different to what the end, you know, what the current thing is. And I mean it, it was really bare bones, it was just barely there. There, there were maybe you know, a few bits of very important information, but it contained almost no content. But it was still enough to to kind of release this and have people look at it and have people access it and, and react to it. And this provided an incredible amount of feedback and information for them. And obviously there was also a lot of room for it to be misinterpreted. So, and, and it was misinterpreted. There were people who were saying, hang on a minute, uh, this is broken, this doesn't work. And, and then the team kind of had to almost do a mini PI exercise to say, well, you know, this isn't finished, this is designed for learning. Um, not, this isn't a finished product, we, we know it's missing bits. But even given that, the releasing this early, the, the benefits that the team gained from having done this you know, way before many other teams were released, that that gave them the uh, enough information to then iterate and improve, so that pre uh, the subsequent releases didn't suffer from the problems that this one did. Uh, so, so in the the timeline was 12 weeks for uh, to release the alpha, and then there was some sort of period afterwards to gather feedback. Then there was actually a ministerial decision taken because this was the alpha was a checkpoint to say, hey, do we now proceed with this or do we actually cancel the whole thing? Um, which presumably uh, wouldn't have happened in the past as well. Either you, know, you completely replace something or not. You know, the, the, the team presented the minister in question with a, a way to not have to commit fully to the Really pulling the plug on the previous thing. So after the alpha was was greenlit, the next stage was the beta. So this took a few more months. So this wasn't as quick as the alpha, but so the, the the beta was released several months after the alpha, and uh, it was still a prototype. But I mean, this was the public site. It was still a prototype, but it's still. Um, contained now most of the content and most of the tools that would then end up 
being as the line of sight. So this was somewhere in between a prototype and a finished product. So this was still missing large portions of what is on there now, but it was actually something that could plausibly be called a product and could be used for, for real, by, by real users. And from then on, actually, the team took this forward. This, this became what you see now. So this was never actually turned off. So this was then just iterated, iterated, iterated until it became the product that you see now. Um, and so the, what this allowed the team to do was actually to practice very many things. So they could practice running a real website. They could practice evolving a website. Um, they even practiced the switchover. So there, at some point there was, there had to be a point where you switch the old site off and you know redirect everything from the old site to the new site. And so they even could practice that. So this picture shows how that was done. So with the, the during the beta stage, all the traffic was going to the old sites. So the team put a redirector in place. Before they had a dark launch before the proper launch, so they could actually siphon off a little bit of traffic onto the onto the new site before actually, you know, pulling the switch. And actually, when the day came to switch it over, it was not dramatic at all. It was it had been already practiced and it just worked. Um, so this was the tweet on on the day of the switch over. So. Paul, Paul came in at very early in the morning to switch the redirector over. So, number two, product analytics. So, one of the, one of the rules, uh, one of the main rules in the, in the style guide, uh, sorry, in the design principle that GDS has, so GDS has a, a set of design principles um, to allow us this kind of like a vision for the work that we do, and and one of them is design with data. So when you know when you're a little startup, you have no customers, designing with data may be trickier. You know when when you have you know 60 million end users, and you know you you, you can't really complain that you don't have enough data. In fact, you've got the opposite problem. So you have almost too much data. Um, and so, I mean, the anal analytics, like web analytics is, is a great tool that the team was able to utilize to make a lot of the very difficult decisions uh, during the course of the project. So before launch, like while the migration was happening to the new site, uh, the team could look at the analytics and say, okay, which content belongs on the new site at all? So we, we had the, you know, originally we had the problem with lots of duplication and lots of confusing content. How do we decide of the 1,800 things, which ones actually get moved across? Well, okay, so we can pull up the analytics from all of these old sites and then see who's actually accessing this. Is anybody reading this content? Is this useful for anybody? And then immediately you can see which part is actually useful for somebody and which part is just someone's pet project that they thought would be useful to have on the government site. And I mean, having this data simplified a lot of very potentially very tricky conversations because obviously you're sitting there, you know, with an axe chopping, you know, people's hard work. Uh, this was sort of evidence, so you could say, bring me the evidence that this content belongs on, on the new platform. And if you can't provide it, then it doesn't come across. Another thing that the web analytics was able to provide was actually uh, nuances around the specific user needs. So in order to be able to understand and group and categorize the content, um, I mean, it, it's quite tricky. There's very many different cases to consider. So what the team did was they took search data. Um, they took data coming in from Google um, about what people were actually searching for when they landed on, on, on these government pages. And actually, that allowed the team to then uh, really refine and group things together. 
so just even looking at popular search terms allowed them to have a better insight into what the people are actually wanting to do. Uh, and I think, uh, unfortunately, this has become, I'm not sure whether this would be possible now because I think Google are a bit, uh, I don't think Google are sending through the search results anymore. So, but I mean, at the time, this was a very useful source to really understand the user a lot better. Another very important thing that the team could get from the analytics was where the users were coming from. So quite early on, the team identified that more than 50% of the users were coming in through search. And search, I mean, even now, search means basically Google. So that allowed the team to concentrate pretty early on on SEO and, and really decide, OK, it's important for us that uh, the, the page ranks highly in Google. And it's important that we, you know, we call the, the, the pages what people are actually searching for. And also, the target devices was an important p bit of information. So looking at the analytics uh, could, um, could me uh, meant that the team wouldn't actually, you know, they, they looked at the statistics and saw, okay, IE6 isn't actually above the 2% threshold of, of, of the users, which meant that we couldn't, we could actually almost not support those users. And when I say not support, it didn't have to look good in IE6. That saved the team a whole lot of effort. Um, so it still has to work with IE6. It can't be completely broken, but that obviously freed the team up you know, to actually do work on, on browsers that mattered. Another point that was identified pretty early on from, from this was the importance of mobile. So at the point, at that time, I think it was 10% uh, of users were using mobiles to access the site. And actually now it's up to 30, 30%. Uh, so the, the site was designed to be responsive from the, from the start. So and you know people that's only going to rise in fact there's a transaction that gds is running that where it's actually flipped more than 50% are using mobiles to actually access it so more people are using it on mobiles than on desktops which i guess is the trend uh, I, I don't think that's going to be reversed and Web analytics allowed us to then define success metrics. So now we've got a production site. We want to understand how well is each piece of content performing. So we can put, admittedly, fairly crude metrics into it, which would allow us to say, OK, this is people engaging with this or people aren't engaging with this. So for flat content, I believe the success criteria is if a user's been on the site for seven seconds or more, or has clicked on a link within the site. I mean, it's, it's, it's rudimentary, but that at least allows you to triage, well, well, like be able to see of the seven, several hundred pages that we have, which ones are the worst performing, which ones are the best performing. So this is a very useful success measure. Any questions before I move on? Sure. And as I understand, the, the beta launch was launched publicly. So, what tools were uh, used to gather customer feedback from the public audience? Sure. So, the question was which tools were used to gather feedback from the yeah. public? Um, so, I mean, there was the obvious talking to people. Uh, I think part of it was actually you know, showing it to other people within government. Um, there were ways to there were ways to comment on the site there were things like get satisfaction um, there were blog posts and people you know blog posts about the process and people would engage on the blog so i mean there was a bunch of different mechanisms um, that people were using and actually now there's there's a help desk we 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 have a help desk that allows us to um, you know people can write to us directly Okay, so 
performance dashboards. So I showed you this, uh, this graphic already. This is actually on the live site. Th this isn't sort of a custom graph. This is something that uh, is on the live site and is updated daily. Uh, and the GovUK team actually has a team of people who work on visualizations and work on ways to present the data in a very clear manner. Uh, I, I mean, one thing that I really like about this is is how it kind of, they, they don't overload it with too much information. So these things are aimed at telling a story rather than providing you with the maximum amount of information. So here's, here's the dashboard for the content quality. And I, so I, I mentioned the success criteria for, for content. So uh, this visualization allows you to see which content is gets the most views, uh, so you have more views here, less of views here, and you've got engagement, so the most engaging content is here and the least is here. And so, I mean, this doesn't pack a lot of information, but the nice thing about it is how it's, you've got your quadrants. So if you've got content in this area where it's got lots of views and people aren't engaging with it, that's an area of focus. So. I think this is quite a powerful feedback mechanism because you can kind of have people look at this and you know it tells a story quite quickly. Um, and as, as I mentioned, the, the GovUK team has a team of folks that are working to present information or trying to present information in a very clear way. And I mean, this is, this is going to be developed more and more and more metrics will be published on the live site about all of the services that GovUK is hosting. Uh, so I'll probably skip this one. Uh, I'll talk about uh, user research. So the the product analytics gives gives the team a good a good uh, picture of what is happening, but not necessarily why it is happening. So let's say people aren't engaging with the content. We can see that from our tracking. How do we figure out why that is? So this is where user research comes in. So there's a team dedicated to finding out, you know, working with users and understanding, putting you know, themselves into the mind of a user. So in the life cycle of a product, there, there's a bunch of different activities that this team does. So early on, it's, it's, it's quite sort of in-depth. It's like it's research, you know, very in-depth studies of users and trying to understand and, and present that information back to the development team. And once there's code live, or once there is code, it's just testing, 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 testing. So one of the probably the most important things that the user research team had, has been doing with GovUK is lab testing, which means bringing people into a laboratory environment where they can, you know, they can show them parts of the site or give them tasks, have them in, use the site, and then measure what are people confused about, where are they going, where, where are things going wrong, and then immediately ask them, you know, what were you thinking here? Why, why did that? You know, why did you do what you did? So the home page was an area that actually went through many different iterations as a result of user testing. So in the first iteration, so this was the alpha. And for the beta, th this was, this was the, the beta home page. And actually, feedback from users was that this looked like a domain parking page. So. Uh, that wasn't exactly, it's not exactly what you want to hear if you're, you know, building a trustworthy government website. So that was changed um, to this. This was the next iteration. So I guess this looks less like a domain parking page now. Um, the feedback on this iteration was that people didn't really get these icons. And actually, the, I mean, the, the page was very sparse. But that wasn't necessarily a good thing. People, you know, the, the homepage didn't really give people a lot of information. Another fairly 
major problem was this focus on search. So initially, the designers were really, really in love with sort of the idea is like Google is your home page. So you know, you come to GovUK and then you search for what you want and you know you find it. Actually, what user research found was that the people who were comfortable with search would just use Google. They wouldn't even come to this. It's actually the users that weren't comfortable with search. They wanted to have something that they could actually browse. And so and also combined with the fact that the search was a bit crap, um, this was a bit of a disaster. So uh, this was the next iteration. So you can see the, the categorization is starting to creep in, and the search is kind of getting a bit de-emphasized. So people like this. This was, this was more liked. But actually, because a lot of the categories were below the fold, people the feedback was, actually, I want to know more. And I don't have a full picture of what the site does. So it was redesigned to this. So search is now completely de-emphasized. And you've got the, the categories here. And this is actually, yeah, th this is pretty, this is what went live. So th this was the production version. So all of these iterations happened within the beta. Um, this was just testing, redesigning, testing, redesigning, testing, redesigning. Had the team not released this publicly, they wouldn't have gotten all this feedback, probably. Any questions? So the question was, how uh, do we? How, how did the team receive user feedback? Sure. So the, there's many different ways. Um, so there's, I mean, so you've got, let's say, guerrilla testing. That means you just grab a phone and go out onto the street and get people to use it and just look at their reaction. I mean, that's a one very cheap way. Uh, you can have um, lab testing. You can get people in. You can have uh, remote usability testing where people install something on their on their computers and then you can record kind of their clicks and things like that. So there's there's quite a, a number of different tools that are actually fairly cheap now as well that pretty much anyone can use. I mean, these are you know they're they're often services that you can actually buy and 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 test things with this way. So number five, last point, uh, DevOps. So GovUK is operated using a DevOps model. And what does that mean? That means that developers and operations are building the live services together. There's no separation and there's no handover of stuff. That means the developers have the keys to production. That means I, as a developer, can pretty much push code that's been reviewed and okayed by the product owner. No one, there's no production team that will stop me from doing this. On the flip side, the operations aren't responsible for fixing things if I break them. So, you know, if I push something crap, I have to go and fix it. Um, I mean, and this is different to the whole change management sort of culture that I used to work in before, and, and it's I, I can't really believe that this is on government infrastructure. Like this is a government thing. Um, it's great. It's it's like the best environment I've worked on because it makes things like this possible. So I, I was I was coming into work on the train. I had an idea. I, I coded it up. Um, I talked to my product owner, got a code review, had a quick test on, on our preview and staging environments, and got it pushed out by 1020. So this was within three hours. I had a change on government infrastructure. Uh, that's pretty awesome. Um, and I mean, for me as a dev, that's that's great because actually I'm a lot closer to production. I I know exactly what's going on, and I've got information from uh, you know th there are a bunch of tools that our infrastructure folks provide to us to make sure that we do know what's going on and that we can debug things and fix them quickly. And for the infrastructure folks, that's that's really good because they don't actually chase production problems all day. They can actually improve the platform and 
consult with the developers to make sure that they have all the skills and all the tools available. And the net effect of this is that uh, we've been able to do a thousand changes, code changes in our first eight months. So that's seven on average a day. I think that's slowed down a bit before because the platform is a bit more stable, but it's down to like six a day. So, you know, and, and we, we haven't had any major outages. Um, so, I mean, this seems to work pretty well for us. And just for completion, so the other two methods that I didn't have time for were accessibility testing and direct user feedback. So if you have any questions to those, please come and talk to me after. Thank you very much. Jake, and we have time for one or two questions. Are there any questions? Yes. Would you try doing same stuff on, let's say, internet banking application? Uh, yes. I think so. I think we wouldn't be quite so blasé with releasing on an internet banking application. However, I think it's still possible. So it's true that if stuff breaks on, on an information website, um, it's not the end of the world. Uh, and actually, the, the way we've architected it, you just get stale information. So it's, you know, the impact to the user is generally not very high. I would still do this on a sort of a, something that involves money. Um, it's just you have to have more tests. Okay. okay. Last question from Vidas. How did government made this happen? I mean, how did it all start? It? I'm just thinking about the standard government organization says we need a new website to mer to migrate all uh, all our to one organization to one domain. And okay, let's do it in a startup way. That doesn't sound right. So, <laughs> how did this happen? Okay, so I think the history was there was a very influential report published that caught the eye of a minister. So we, uh, this project had ministerial approval and, and um, ministerial backing, was, which was very important. Which, which minister, which uh, The minister of the cabinet office. Uh, so a, a senior minister as well within government. And then he got a bunch of really crazy people together who then were protected from the craziness of government and, and could build up this very unusual organization within it. And then by basically delivering again and again and again, the team was able to build trust until they were entrusted with the delivery responsibility for this government site. Okay, so thank you, Jake, for the presentation about the government. And here, small present from us. Thank you very you. much. <laughs> thank you. And now we are having closing keynote in the whole 5.1. And don't forget to fill your feedback forms because we will have prizes. <laughs>